Good afternoon. Today's talk is about Project Santa Cruz, and we'll divide it into two parts. First, I'll talk about the hardware. My name is Sean, and I'm a product manager working on our mobile devices, including Project Santa Cruz. Second, my colleague Katie will come on stage and talk about developing content for this device. Now, I remember my first experience trying one of the earliest prototypes. Max, my manager, took me to this sort of secret room. Uh, to be honest, from the outside, it looked like a broom closet. And on the inside was this suspiciously colored wallpaper. My first reaction was that I need this wallpaper for my own closet. And my second reaction was, what is this headset? Now, I didn't quite do what Rasmus did and climb under the table, um, but I did put it on, and it sort of just felt like Rift. And my first reaction was, the tracking looks great. You know, it seems to have positional tracking. What is this? Um, and then it sunk in. There are no external trackers here, and everything is on the headset. And that's when it hit me that this had the potential to untether an experience and be totally freeing. Now, I was so excited that I actually left behind my previous life on the software team and switched to hardware. At the time, we had a lot of open questions. How do you design the sensor? How do you integrate this into an actual standalone form factor? And Ottman, our chief architect, pulled me aside and was like, are you insane? Thankfully, we're all a bit crazy. And I'm proud to share how far we've come. I want to take you along that same journey that I took as we unraveled the complexities and trade-offs in designing the Santa Cruz prototype. There are two key systems to Project Santa Cruz. The first is headset tracking and how we achieve that sense of freedom. And the second is how we're iterating on controllers. So let's get started with headset tracking. Now, on Rift, the trackers are on the outside facing the headset. On Santa Cruz, the sensors are on the headset facing out. This is why we call it inside-out tracking. Inside-out tracking begins with the sensor design. And this was actually the first question for the team. Well, maybe the second question. The first question everyone asked was if I was an intern. I guess I look a little young. Um, <laughs> now, this question was, how do we figure out which sensor to use? We started off with this proof of concept. We took old Crescent Bay's tracking sensors, pulled them out of their casing, and mounted them to the headset. It looks like this. We call this actually the Santa Cruz Monarch. And the goal of the Santa Cruz Monarch was to be a proof of concept for inside-out tracking, so we picked the best sensors possible. These sensors have a wide 180-degree field of view and served a great job of proving out the tech. Of course, the sensors are a little bit big for a standalone device. Um, you can see what it looks like on a person. I thought it was pretty cool, but my cat was a bit freaked out. Um, so the next hurdle was, could we get this system integrated with smaller sensors onto a standalone form factor? And here's what we showed off last year at Oculus Connect. Uh, you can see that the sensor modules on this device are a lot smaller, and they're integrated onto the headset with the compute. And this prototype helped us answer how many sensors do you need, and where do they go on the device? When thinking about that question, you have to realize that the sensors are used not only for inside-out tracking of the headset, but also controller tracking. Hugo, in his keynote, talked a bit about why we use a four-sensor system to maximize what the head headset can see for controllers. But where do you place these four sensors is the next question. You know, we put the sensors on the outside edge of the headset in order to maximize how much they can see. Now, like Mike and Adam and others on the mechanical engineering uh, team are trying to figure out the tricky part of where exactly do you place them. If you move them, say, two millimeters along the curvature of this surface, it can mean a difference of one foot in the tracking volume. And we've spent months iterating between the mechanical engineering, computer vision, industrial design, and content teams to really make sure that natural gestures feel good. Things like waving to a friend, throwing a ball, or wielding a sword. Now, cameras on the edge, though, have yet another challenge. 
Kevin from our reliability team surprised me with this video. I uh, still cringe every time this happens. Um, now, just because this survived, it does not suggest that, we, uh, that you drop your headsets at home. Now, the natural answer is to protect these sensors. We've added plastics around them so the sensors are recessed. But protections trade off with aesthetics and design, and our design principles are centered first and foremost around comfort and usability. Quinton and Brian on our team have actually run hundreds of people through ergonomic studies looking at weight and comfort. Now, weight isn't as simple as just total mass. It's also how that mass is distributed, and that's why we call it perceived weight. Last year, the Santa Cruz prototype actually weighed 850 grams. That's a whopping two pounds. But the perceived weight wasn't as bad because the compute and battery are on the back, and it acted to counterbalance that front module. In our most recent design, we've moved that that compute and that battery to the front module. And so along with doing that, we've had to really, really cut down the weight on the product. Even with this, though, what feels good for one person doesn't really necessarily feel good for another person. And we have to consider a diversity of different facial structures. Here's a head scan of one person's profile. This person actually represents the fifth percentile in brow depth. They only have 0.48 centimeters. If you look at the 95th percentile, though, it's actually 2.43 centimeters. And this almost two centimeter difference makes a huge difference in how this device puts pressure points on the face, how comfortable, and how usable it is. And we want to design this device to work for a really wide range and diverse set of faces. Now, the final part of tracking, of course, is safety. You might recognize this from Riff today, which is the Guardian system. And it's meant to help you understand your physical space while in the virtual world. We're adapting a similar system for Project Santa Cruz. Now, this continues to be an active area of investigation for us, so you can expect details in the future. I've talked a bit about our journey on the headset, but the second piece is on controllers. Controllers are really important because they allow us to express ourselves in virtual worlds. We've tried to capture a lot of the big learnings from touch, but adapt them for our standalone form factor. And there are a few big adaptations. Let's start with tracking. Hugo talked about how inside-out tracking required that we invert the tracking ring from what touch had. We also have to consider the specific locations of LEDs on this controller tracking ring. The controllers need to be tracked from up close to about arm's distance length. And what Andrew and our CV team will tell you is that distance matters a lot. If you measure a lot of people's arms, it's about 1.1 meters. And the reason that distance matters is because if you have too many LEDs on that tracking system, and if they're spaced too closely, it becomes this sort of amorphous, untrackable blob. So that's why you can't have too many. If you have too few, you hit the issue of occlusion. Let's take, for instance, trying to draw a bow and arrow. With this gesture, if you have too few LEDs, one hand actually occludes the other. So the natural solution is to actually grow that tracking ring or add more LEDs. But that is a trade-off then, though, with ergonomics and design. Getting these controllers tracked, though, is just the first step. There's the next question about what can you actually do with them? We're thinking through what controls and buttons to actually put on the Santa Cruz controllers. We've kept the Oculus and menu buttons. We've kept the trigger and the grip button. But one experiment we're looking at is actually with touch pads. And touch pads offer some really nice affordances for swiping, scaling, and manipulating objects. We want each of these elements on the controllers to feel really great. And what do I mean by feel great? Jeff on our team, let's say for the touchpad, actually plots one of these for each touchpad. It's called a force displacement curve. On the x-axis is displacement. It's how far down you've depressed the touchpad. And on the y-axis is force. What's that resistance that you feel back from it? Each of these curves represents a different spot if you were to press down on that touchpad. And the point is that we want that touchpad to feel great no matter where you press down on it. We've gone through hundreds of prototypes and I'm pretty sure that Peter, Ian, and the ID team could open up a museum with all the different 
the different pieces. Now, the last piece to consider is manufacturability. Even if a design works as a prototype, we have to make sure that it can be built at scale. How easy is it to assemble? How consistently can it be built? I've given you a snapshot into where things stand today with Project Santa Cruz and the prototype. From that first moment I tried the magic of freedom in that broom closet, I knew we had something very, very special. It's been an incredible journey working with this team, and we're excited to have shared this progress with you today. With that, I'll pass it over to Katie to talk about content. Thanks, Sean. So hi, uh, my name is Katie, and I'm a game designer on the Oculus Rex team in Seattle. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Rex is Oculus's internal content team. And in the past, we've created some experiences that you're probably familiar with, such as Dream Deck, Toy Box, for those of you who are old school, uh, Farlands, which uh, shipped with the, the first Rift launch, Prologue, which is uh, the tutorial for the Gear VR, and First Contact, the tutorial that comes with your touch controllers out of the box. And today, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about my team's experience developing for Santa Cruz over the last few months. Uh, so first of all, good news, everybody. This device is the real deal. Uh, from a developer standpoint, it's actually kind of amazing. Uh, inside out, fully tracked headset with rich, uh, fully tracked hand presence and six degrees of freedom is finally a reality, and it's amazing. Uh, and users can take the device anywhere. No cords, no PC required, which is just a whole new thing. Uh, so finally, the worlds of mobile VR and PC VR are starting to converge. Uh, but how do you design for a device like this? When my team broke ground on our first demo experience several months ago, we set off to find out. So uh, here on the Rex team, we're developing a virtual pet demo on Santa Cruz, which we call Boundless. Uh, you may have seen this already a bit in Hugo's keynote earlier. The creature's name is Bogo. Uh, she's amazing, and she wants to be your best friend. Uh, in this experience, we wanted to really closely emulate the way that people interact with their real pets at home. We wanted to give them total freedom of movement and rich tactile feedback. So I will cover our movement solution first. For some players, hanging out with a pet is a really great way to make you totally forget about the headset sitting on your face. And we quickly started to see people move around exactly as they would in real life, which is great. Uh, they had no fear of their cord getting in the way or losing tracking. But for other players, we also learned that movement with Santa Cruz can be a little tricky. Uh, players need to spend time kind of immersing themselves and getting used to this new device. Mobile users are used to having totally stationary experiences, and PC VR users are used to having the cord orient them back towards their PC. Uh, but neither of these are the case with Santa Cruz. And there's also the question of what happens when the player uses their device in a non-traditional space. So what happens if they take it to a gymnasium, or a circus tent, or a broom closet? Uh, with the last generation of PC VR devices, we could make a reasonable assumption as developers that the player had just a cord's length worth of space, but now we can't. So how do we inform the player about their spatial limits? So we've actually started to think about design for this category of device, much in the same way that we would think about modern mobile or web development. Uh, Remember the good old days when websites were built to exactly one size and it didn't matter how much monitor real estate you had, like at all, because everything was just centered? For VR, we can think of this first wave of devices and experiences through that lens. Um, a lot of them just don't scale at all in their environment. And uh, so Job Simulator is an example of an experience that does scale really well, but many of them don't. Uh, but when players have access to larger and more diverse play spaces, all of a sudden it's difficult to hard code a one-size-fits-all solution to an environment which works for players without breaking immersion. And these days, good websites and mobile experiences uh, repurpose the user space in an intelligent way. So if the user takes the site to a smaller screen, say a mobile phone or a tablet, then the site changes too. And this metaphor of changing spaces is very applicable to thinking about spatial design for Santa Cruz. 
So here's an early example of how we might tackle this in Project Boundless and in future experiences that we build. Uh, these bright floor tiles actually scale and shift with the boundaries, and that communicates the player space back to them long before they reach a guardian wall. Uh, our intention within our team is to continue developing a fully resizing template which uses the space that players have available to them, intelligently rearranging gameplay objects as the player's space shrinks or grows. Of course, a solution like that isn't necessarily realistic for every developer. So, to that end, Guardian will be a new and improved experience with Santa Cruz. Uh, it's still an active area investigation for the team right now, but we're working on the user experience for setting up and rendering Guardian in your environments across multiple environments. With a cordless system, it's extra important to us to make sure that your players always feel like their boundary information is safe and reliable. And, of course, this being a portable device, uh, sometimes users might take it places without properly setting up Guardian first. Or they might use it in a totally stationary location, such as a, a train or a plane or a hospital bed. So think about also how you'll handle these stationary or small space cases. Uh, for example, consider allowing the user to pull in interactable objects or implementing a basic teleportation system as a small space fallback. So the second component that we're designing around is rich hand presence. Uh, for those of you who are touch developers, this is obviously nothing new. But for those of you coming from mobile, this is a whole new dimension to think about. So here are two examples. On the left, you see a user moving their fingers over a touch controller. And on the right, a Santa Cruz controller. Uh, this is a really early Santa Cruz controller prototype without some of the additional affordances that we've added. So the fidelity is only going to increase from here, but as you can see now, the difference already isn't that large. In fact, it's so small that when I was putting together this slide, numerous people were confused and were like, shouldn't those be swapped? And I was like, nope, <laughs> that's correct. Uh, the one major addition to think about is the thumb touchpad, as Sean mentioned earlier. Uh, so in addition to emulating touch functionality with buttons and sticks, you can also now represent motions such as flicking and rubbing and pinching with ease. We have a super cool card flicking prototype internally. Uh, the thumb touchpad also works as a kind of mouse pad, and it clicks in like a button. It uh, feels really nice. It will be backwards compatible with most touch experiences, but also consider how touch functionality might change the way that your app works with the touchpad. There we go. Uh, and of course, just like with touch, uh, the controllers will offer tactile feedback, which will help to make interactions like this one feel realer than ever. Uh, these controllers are also significantly lighter than touch controllers, which makes them much easier for your users to play with for long periods. Uh, Santa Cruz's compute is a high-end mobile compute. So when you're developing experiences, our current recommendation is that you follow some pretty typical mobile game optimization practices. So these include using static lighting if possible, using forward rendering rather than deferred, avoiding post-processing effects, uh, avoiding dynamic shadows, and keeping overdraw from transparent objects or materials to a minimum. Using your game engine's profiling tools to detect if your CPU or GPU bound so that you can optimize intelligently from there. And limiting your poly count to sub 150K and keeping your draw calls under 150 if you can. Uh, so that's all that I personally have to share with you today. But before we wrap up, I'd like you to hear from the team that's bringing you this new device. Santa Cruz is the future. This is what VR should be. I think it's only going to get better as the technology keeps pushing the envelope. If you compare it to last year, I think it's night and day. The controllers have come online, and with that comes rich hand presence, and that's completely changed the ballgame here. The Santa Cruz controllers were designed to allow a large range of gestures. We weren't sure that we were gonna be able to get. But we spent months perfecting the camera placement, the controller design, to make sure we're getting all these gestures that you might not be able to get with other standalone headsets. If you don't have good tracking, you don't have good VR. 
And if you're constantly gonna be using these controllers in this headset anywhere you want, then it needs to work wherever you wanna go. an amazing response bringing people into the device for the first time. The sheer joy that people have when they realize that they're that free, it's completely made me believe that Inside Out Track VR is the future. It's a workout that time. Yeah. Cool, so thank, thanks everybody. Um, we're really con <laughs> Uh, we're really excited to continue sharing more with you guys in the months to come. Uh, for those of you who are here with the press, we'll be showing you what this device can do here on site this week uh, with that prototype that you guys just saw with the BOGO. Uh, and for those of you who are developers, uh, we're going to be getting devices and dev kits into your hands next year. Uh, so Sean and I, actually, for lack of time, will be taking questions in the hallway outside. So please come find us. We would love to chat with you. And thanks.